Good evening, everyone, and welcome to a new webinar episode in collaboration with Affinity United Nations Youth Australia and Green Hope Foundation. To begin, I would like to respectfully acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the land on which I am situated on today. Affinity UN Youth New South Wales and Green Hope Foundation pay our respects to their elders, past, present and future, and to all descendants who have cared for this place since creation. We also honour all other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us today. My name is Iris Brown and I am a volunteer with United Nations Youth New South Wales. United Nations Youth is a youth-led organisation that aims to educate and empower young Australians on global is issues by fostering ideas and innovation. International Youth Day, celebrated on the 12th of August every year, is a celebration of the important role young people play in nation building, community growth, and social, social issues that young people raise awareness on and are affected by. The theme for 2021 is Transforming Food Systems, Youth Innovation for Human and Planetary Health. We have brought together a panel of speakers who address what building a sustainable future with the youth means. The pandemic harshly affected minorities and people from low socioeconomic backgrounds, but also deeply scarred the future of the youth. The pandemic posed and continues to pose serious questions about what the future and safety of our planet and youth look like, and what sort of future we are walking into. The panic buying, the lack of job security and research all have shown us one thing, young people are vulnerable. This vulnerability affects their capability to access healthy food. When basic human needs are threatened, such as inaccessibility, inaccessible opportunities for healthy food, young people are prevented from fully participating in our society. Our panelists, joining from Australia and Canada, will discuss how we can ensure youth voices are amplified through sustainable innovation and what the process of enabling these youth look like. Without further ado, I would now like to introduce tonight's distinguished facilitator, Jack Evans. Jack is a proud Camilleroy man, has been working at the ABC since 2011. He is currently a senior reporter and a presenter for the ABC Kids news program, Behind the News, also known as BTN. BTN has a focus on explaining major news events and updates to upper primary children in a fun and easy way to understand. Welcome, Jack. Thank you very much, Iris, for that. I, um, I think that's the first time I've been called distinguished and I quite liked it. So thank you for that. And a, a welcome to everyone. Um, I would also like to acknowledge um, the Ghana people whose uh, land I am on today and extend um, and pay my respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander viewers today. Um, so as Iris mentioned, uh, it is international uh, youth Day, and this year's theme is Transforming Food Systems, Youth Innovation for Human and Planetary Health. So over the past few years, we've seen young people speak out on many issues. Um, and tonight we're going to chat a bit about what types of support systems are needed to be able to help the efforts of young people in restoring and protecting our planet, in particular through the transformation of food systems. Um, I'm not going to be able to really answer any of that because that is not my area of expertise. So fortunately, I'm going to be joined um, by UN Youth New South Wales uh, President Steph Sekolovska um, and presenter for ABC Radio Dylan Stora. We will also hopefully be joined by Kekashan Basu later on from Canada, but we're having a bit of technical difficulties also. She's coming to us from Canada, so you have to expect that. Hi, guys. Hi, Steph and Dylan. How are you? Hello. <laughs> Going well. Hi. Yeah, doing well over here. Oh, good. Happy, happy International Youth Day. <laughs> um, Thank you. I think we should Thank start. Let, let's, let's start with that because it is um, International Youth Day. And um, I guess I want to know what is the significance of the day um, for both of you and in particular around the work that you do. So Steph, if you want to start. Of course. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jack. I think, first of all, um, I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm coming in from Bidjigal land. Um, but I guess I guess the importance of, you know, International Youth Day uh, to my work at, at UN Youth 
I think first and foremost is really it's a it's a day of recognition. Um, and while I understand that obviously recognition and, and talking about the issues that young people face, you know, is not enough. We need action. I, I definitely think it's a step in the right direction. And I think in particular, you know, leading a, a youth organisation where all of our volunteers are below the age of 26 and we're running programs for young people who predominantly are in high school. It, it's particularly important because we are working with the young people who are the leaders in their communities, you know, the young people who um, are facing a multitude of, you know, today's current, you know, issues at, at many intersections um, that often, you know, aren't elevated in, you know, mainstream media. So um, I think, yeah, International Youth Days is, is so important. And what about you, Dylan? Yeah, sort of coming off um, what Steph said, and I'm coming from um, Wajuk land of the of the Noongar Nation uh, this uh, this evening. Um, but what what Steph just mentioned there about about mainstream media, I guess the question being what what the significance um, of International Youth Day is to the work that that I do, um, and and in general, it probably isn't enough to be completely honest. Um, and that's a lot of the work that I do. Um, you know, I, I work in ABC local radio, which isn't necessarily the the national youth broadcaster. Um, we we have a predominantly older audience, um, but but we've it's extremely important to highlight uh, the work that young people do in and around our communities. And I think that, that a day like this, it's extremely important to, at all levels of, of our media, um, to, to take a step back and really um, evaluate and think of how we can bring more young people into our discussions, um, whether that be well, wherever in the, in the public square, but especially in my work um, yeah, with, with the media. Do you feel like you have to become a bit of a spokesperson for um, for young people, Dylan? Um, I think that I think that can happen from time to time. Um, I think you know. I think we're we we're, we're slowly getting there. Um, we've got a lot of there's an internal bias when it comes to to working in media, and that is. You know, we, we want to go to, to the, the distinguished experts and a lot of the time the distinguished experts are older um, people and they're, you know, predominantly in, in large part, they come from a particular, they're, they're male, um, they're, they're white um, and, and they're older. Um, and I think that's something that we've got to break down sort of those barriers. I think the ABC is making, you know, doing a lot of great work uh, in that field. Um, we're, we're doing a lot of work and, and it's certainly at the front of our mind um, in the work that I was doing, uh, working out of the broom office um, in our radio programming to get uh, extremely diverse views on, on a lot of issues and on a lot of topics. Um, we're, we're talking about so much stuff and, and we've got to reflect, we've got to reflect the communities that we serve um, and young people are really massive parts of the communities that we serve. And um, speaking of issues, I, I want to move a bit towards this year's theme. What exactly do we mean when we talk about food systems and why do they matter for young people, I guess? Dylan, would you, or, or I Steph? Might, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm happy to take the lead on this one. I think this year's theme is really important because it works on a number of levels, right? I think at the at the core of it, we're, we're not only talking about food systems, but we're talking about youth innovation. And we're talking about the space that young people have when it comes to talking about food systems and when it comes to planetary and human health as well. Um, I definitely think food security and sustainability is at the core of you know what young people have to do moving forward but more importantly the the measures of accountability that we you know place on our our government and and the people who are currently in charge you know of, of the world who, who tend not to be young people unfortunately um and so it, it really sort of is at the core of a lot of other problems as well that compound when young people and you know the world in general you know don't have that equal access you know to, to food or resources when it comes to, to health um, both you know physical um, and, and mental but also planetary right when it comes to things you know like climate change and you know the scarcity of resources that future generations are going to to be faced with um, and so I think youth innovation really 
ties together with all of that because a, a lot of the time young people's views aren't stagnant, they're not static, where the people that aren't necessarily afraid to, to confront change. And I think we've been able to see that with movements, whether it's, you know, petitions or protests or climate strikes across the world. I don't think we're willing to just sit down complacently. Um, we're not necessarily, you know, the the apathetic caricatures we're so often, you know, painted to be, I think, you know. Um, and, and just going off, I guess, you know, what, what Dylan was saying earlier, placing, you know, I guess, youth innovation at the forefront also, you know, removes that that idea or that barrier of, you know, experience or age meaning expertise. Um, and, and so I think it, it's, it's really important to place that at the forefront, you know, when we're talking about those big issues that young people are going to be faced with, with moving forward. What are then um, some of the things in terms of uh, food systems that need to change or need to improve um, within the near future, the, the long distant future, what are some things that need to change? Um, I definitely think, you know, when it comes to food systems, it it's really, I guess, about sustainability and acknowledging privilege um, in, for example, a country like Australia, where often, you know, we do distance ourselves from, you know, the issues when it comes to scarcity of resources that are faced, you know, by, by other parts of the world, but also acknowledging, I guess, food systems, you know, within our own country. Um, you know, so often, you know, people do have to live, you know, day to day or, you know, below the line. And that often isn't acknowledged, you know, by a government that makes it sound so easy, you know, to, you know, get into the job market, you know, or the housing market. Um, and often, you know, practices like sustainability, which often are kind of, you know, uh, you know, praised as being, you know, the way forward when it comes, you know, to, to food systems, you know, often are, I guess, you know, subtracted out of the equa equation when young people, you know, need to think about things like, you know, rent, um, you know, or, or paying other bills, you know, or, or groceries. Um, and so, you know, often I, I do think that, you know, we need to normalise and, you know, hold governments accountable to, you know, really putting in place these sustainable practices or mandating them in a way that isn't necessarily going to put young people or young families out of pocket. And Dylan, what are your um, thoughts on this year's theme, food systems, and and what do you think are some changes that are needed? Yeah, it, it's a, it's an interesting theme. To be completely honest, uh, for for an international youth day, I, I would I was a bit surprised, but but in a in a good way. Um, I come from a from a region like I, I grew up in the Kimberley, which is a predominantly agricultural region, um, predominantly beef production um and it, yeah I, I was i was pleasantly surprised when i found out that that was the theme for this year's international youth day um because i think it, it highlights so many issues and, and steph 100 percent on on what you've mentioned there um when it comes to to equity uh, in the food system but it, it also comes to i guess the sustainability of, of the production of, of food as well um and you know agriculture being such a large part of, of where i grew up in Fitzroy crossing um we've seen you know there, there are a lot of, of young farmers coming up through the ranks um, and they're sort of agitating that change. I think the, the beef industry in Australia now has a net zero by 2030 target. Um, and I know that there's a lot of people that are that are going to be holding um, them accountable for that. Um, so you've got that side of things, um, that sort of my, my extent of agricultural knowledge. I was, I was a townie um, growing up, but certainly in and around it. So I wasn't on a property. Um, but we've also got that issue of, of equity and access to food. And despite the Kimberley producing so much food um, for the world, there, there is that issue of, of food security um, in the community. Um, and I think that's a, that's a big major issue as well. I know that um, a, a lot of times when, when there is discussions happening in and around the community, um, you're talking about a lot of remote um, Aboriginal communities um, where the, uh, the general store 
the cost of food may be extremely expensive. Um, you don't have access to fresh fruit and vegetables. Um, and these are issues that young people um, in the community are raising. I recently went along with the youth representative to the UN through a lot of remote parts of Northern WA and, and into the Northern Territory as well. And, and that's something that, that so many young people actually raise, to be completely honest. It, it's not something that gets raised so much um, in, in metropolitan areas, um, not so much having not having access to food, that's an issue everywhere, but, but not even sort of having fresh fruit and vegetable. The roads can get cut off. Um, I know there's a community up in, in the Northern Territory, um, in Nolanboy and, and in East Arnhem Land, where if you know there, there's bad weather and, and the ferry can't get through. Um, this, this is in, in mainland Australia, there's, there's a Woolworths up there. Um, the food supply can get cut off for a very long period of time and that can be quite a hard time for, for the people living in those towns. I think it's about creating sustainability in those networks that connect us. Um, it's probably why food system is such an interesting question because it's connected with, with so many elements of, of how the world works. But yeah, I think highlighting the fact that these remote and regional parts of the country produce so much food and, and yet they're still struggling accessing fresh fruit and veg, um, which are so essential to leading a, leading a healthy life. So what are then some roles, and you both have kind of touched on them um, in terms of, uh, you know, younger people working in, in industries and bringing um, different perspectives or, you know, people out there wanting to just see change and, and signing petitions, um, protesting, all of that. But what are, what are, the, what are some other roles um, that younger, the younger generation can play in order to tackle this issue? I think that first and foremost, I would probably say representation would be really important. Um, you know, going back to that idea of, you know, governance, I was often kind of, you know, raised with that view of, you know, you work your way up the ranks and, you know, one day you, you know, you'll be an expert in the field and that's when you'll get to contribute back to society. But I would love to say more of a role for young people, whether it's, you know, at the level of local council or, you know, state government sort of advisory, you know, committees, you know, or, or on a federal level either, you know, as, you know, being politicians, you know, or, you know, advisors. Often, you know, we're siloed into, you know, creating those, you know, intangible sort of, you know, inconsequential activities, you know, just for other young people. And and rarely we're sort of asked about, you know, the ways that these big issues like, you know, uh, food systems actually, you know, impact and intersect with a wide range of other issues. So I would love to see more of a space for young people on that level of government and and speaking, I guess, more in mainstream media, because I think that's the only way that we're actually going to have our voices heard. I think that globally, we're seeing a mass level of disillusionment when it comes to the biggest problems that young people will end up inheriting, I guess. And, and so I would absolutely love to see more young people involved on those levels. And, and when I talk about, you know, government, it doesn't have to be this fanciful idea or, or this dream that might be attained. I'm, I'm talking about working on, on a number of levels and getting young people involved. And so I think the fold really needs to be extended by people who already are in those positions. Because you can say Dylan and I are getting involved in as many ways as possible. We're both, you know, involved in UN youth and a multitude of other young people are volunteers all around the country and, and around the world. And we're getting involved as much as possible through internships. But when those barriers are constantly coming from up above, there's only so much that young people can do to be in those positions of authority where we have autonomy and agency. So I really think that needs to open up from, you know, a higher level um, we can't just expect young people to keep pushing and, and earn their way up to the top. I, I really do want to see action to let young people into those positions. I wonder, are you able to, what do you think is some of the, you know, um, or how are youth led initiatives supported at the moment? And how do, how do you think that is different to the way other types, um, other types of organisations are supported? 
Dylan, I don't know if you want to take the lead on this one and then I'm happy to jump in after you. Oh, it, it is it is an interesting one. Um, I guess I think it, it de would depend in a lot of ways on, on the type of, of youth organisation that exists there um, and, and the work that you do. I know that, you know, from it is such an interesting question. Um, you know, I mean, money always helps, um, and being able to to have that those resources to to fund activities in the community. I know from the perspective of of UN Youth here in, in WA, um, it's, it's always having those resources, and I think that's probably the biggest thing. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be money, but it's 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 those resources, and whether that be volunteer resources, human capital. Um, to, to be able to, to work in those systems um, and having, having good friends, I guess, um, having, you know, politicians, people in power, um, supporting youth organisations um, publicly. Um, and I, I think that doesn't happen enough, to be completely honest. Um, I think a lot of um, people that, that are in elected positions um, and are in government bureaucracies, it, it is very easy to write off sort of youth-led organisations and being, oh, they're just university clubs or it's a bunch of, you know, teenagers gathering around. Um, but sort of having that, that public friends um, group, maybe there's a parliamentary friends for youth organisations or something that we can get started. But um, sort of just, just having that level of, of support and backing. Um, again, it doesn't always have to be money, resources help. Um, but yeah, just that community level support. Um, it's probably most important um, and that really helps us with, I guess, gaining um, platforms like this to be able to, to speak and, and promote our organisations um, and to sort of broaden our own horizons and, and expand on the work that, that we already do. Yeah, and I can really also, well, I guess, attest to what um, Dylan has said. Uh, I know I attended, I think it was like a, a grants and subsidies meeting recently to try to get funding for UN youth. And we were told that uh, the, the organisations that would be prioritised would be those that have shown, you know, at least five to 10 years of experience of, you know, working in the community. And sure, UN youth has been around for that long, but because by you know, nature of the word youth, we age out at some point and we get replaced. Uh, often our innovative ideas are updated every couple of years. And so we don't always have that backing that an organization that may have been run by the same person for 20 years has had. And so there's a massive sort of impact on young people when we're almost held in a chokehold of having to run the types of activities that are considered acceptable or desirable or meet certain targets, when really a lot of the impact can't be quantified. Uh, it can't necessarily be, you know, put into a statistic. So I think there definitely needs to be a lot more institutional support for young people rather than cornering us into a type of activity or cornering us into a program where we are co-designing it or it is being labelled as a co-design project with older, more established people. I think we really need to have this space to be able to influence all of the community rather than being siloed into just influencing young people for only issues that concern young people, which I think is just a massive misconception. Young people's issues are all of the issues that are plaguing the world today. So I definitely think that there needs to be that sort of institutional support. But further to that, there needs to be a level of trust that is placed in young people to actually not stuff up uh, and, and trust that we do have the lived experience and the knowledge needed to support our community in the best way possible. Yeah, and um, I, I guess, you know, thinking of it like, um, you know, that you, young people problems, like you said, they're everybody problems, especially when we're talking about food sustainability or we're talking about climate change. Why is it, or do you think it's fair to say that um, your generation um, has been, you know, given a the short straw? It, is it, I know that's probably not the term or the phrase everyone uses, but do you think that's fair to say that? <laughs> Dylan, do you have a, or, or Steph? <laughs> yeah, look, I was, 
I was just going to jump in and I guess say, I think to an extent it is fair in that our because of globalization, you know, the excess, excessive rise in consumerism, our the problems that we're facing are wildly different to the problems that have eb- ever been faced before. So to say that we've drawn a, a short straw, I think that it is, you know, it's been a communal young people problem for hundreds of years that young people have probably drawn you know the short straw whether it's you know during the rise of you know industrialization and and young people were forced out of education and working into factories through to the world wars and the 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 issues that have been faced by by young people throughout you know the 70s and the 80s you know with with the cold war whatever it is nowadays i just think that our problems look vastly different and i believe that as an accumulation of everything that has compounded over centuries. In a way, we have been dealt the short straw. We are essentially inheriting uh, a very dismal future, if you can even call it a future with the climate emergency that's going on. And I, I also think that with everything else that's going on, it almost seems as though the climate emergency isn't even the imminent problem. Um, there, there's lots of things that are sort of, I think, going to hinder uh, the the quality of life for young people moving forward. So I definitely think in a way, uh, unless politicians and, and those others who are currently, you know, in positions of power, unless there is mass systemic change, I definitely think that that young people are in a, an extremely vulnerable position. What about you, Dylan? What are your thoughts on that? Do you reckon the younger generations are are they always handed the short straw? And then also, you know, thinking about it, why don't people grow up to then think about that and think when I was a kid, there was a lot of things that I was frustrated by, or or do you think that's going to come, um, you know, when when you guys get older? Oh, that is a really tough question. Um, I would hate to 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 get to get to that age, and I can already <laughs> I can just picture me um, being oh these young people now they don't understand how hard we are. <laughs> we had to solve the whole climate now you've got a healthy environment and, um, <laughs> and you don't understand. Um, yeah, no, I think young people um, have probably always there, there's always big changes that happen. Um, you know, and, and you can't deny the fact that that as time progressed, living standards have improved and there has been massive improvements in, in so, so many ways. Um, but when you look at the way that our our economic systems currently structured, um, it sort of worked for a, for a really good generation of young people. And, and those sort of were the, the, the baby boomers. Um, and, and it has worked really well for them. Um, and I, I understand where a lot of um, people from that generation come from. Um, I've had a lot of frank conversations with them and they sort of, uh, um, I've spoken to older people um, to understand their way. Um, but basically um, what, what like so many people have said is, you know, we, we were raised at, at a time when public education in Australia was well funded. When by the time we got to university education, we could go and enter technical colleges or we could enter tertiary education and it was for free. There was cheaper houses available. Um, and, and we sort of, they had that opportunity laid out in front of them. Um, and, and I look at the, the situation that sort of young people today face and it's a lot of the ways where you know we've got public education in australia it keeps slipping behind like the the government's own rankings currently have you know i don't think there's there's very many public schools anywhere in the country where they're actually funded to the to the to the benchmark standards um and, and have the resources available to them um the prices of, of so many university degrees have have just increased um the, the cost of tafe um has increased as well and you've just got to look at the the price of um of rent at the moment in, in perth is is ridiculous and i know it's the same in so many places around the country um even even you know i know i know even people um up in Broome at the moment young people that are having to look at, at moving away because they can't find a, a place 
to live. Um, and, you know, home ownership is something that is so out of reach. I, I can't even really think about it at this stage without a significant change in, in my personal circumstances at some point in the future to even think about, about buying a, a, a home or, or a place to live in. Um, so it is difficult. Um, and I, I don't like to dwell on problems despite it being, you know, it, it, it's something that not young, young people can't themselves fix it at this stage. Um, and we've sort of got to work with everyone to figure out a way forward. I don't see how that's going to happen, um, you know, w without there being, as Steph mentioned, that sort of systemic change and involving young people a lot earlier in the process um, and a lot earlier in our, in our discussion as a country. Yeah, um, yeah, it's a it's an interesting thing, and it's it's um, it, it's an interesting question to think about. And then you know maybe when you guys have grown up, you can come back to it the time that I asked you that and think did did I am I listening to the youth of today? <laughs> um, we're gonna this we're gonna, gonna on that up, note we're gonna take gonna, we're gonna come up and have have you know um, future generations and they're gonna replay this video and say, well, this is your well, guys back, you know. Mm. There you go. <laughs> Prove them wrong. <laughs> um, we're going to take a, a, a short break now, a short musical break. Um, we have uh, a musical music students um, and teachers as well. Hannah Coles um, featuring Emily Coles' Twins and they're performing Breathe Life by Jack Garrett. Compliment myself for what I've become Tell him I owe it to him Tell him I owe it to him I wouldn't praise myself for every good thing I've done Tell him I owe it to him Tell him I owe it to him Tell him I owe it to Tell him I owe it to Tell him I owe it to Owe it to him Hands upon my chest Oh won't you breathe life Into these dead lungs I keep on dumb my core oh, 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 oh. And keep life warm Against the cold night As our bodies grow To give up and I know when to breathe Believe me, I owe it to him Tell him I owe it to him Tell him I owe it to him Won't you breathe life into these dead lungs? I keep on dumb my core oh, 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 oh. And keep life warm against the cold night As our bodies grow old, grow old, grow Silence as a warning I will not deter your morning and, oh, Won't you breathe life into these dead lungs I keep under my core oh, oh, oh. And Keep life warm against the cold night As our bodies grow
Fantastic. <laughs> I want to clap, but I don't want to also clap into everyone's ears so we can do the tiny, tiny claps. But that was absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much for that, Hannah and Emily, um, for that lovely musical performance. Um, we're going to continue our conversation now. And I kind of want to move things towards something that we're all very familiar with, COVID-19. Um, <laughs> I mean, these days it feels like if you're not in a lockdown, you've just come out of a lockdown. Um, so I, I guess what I want to know is, you know, the, the, the pandemic, it's affected everyone, I think it's fair to say. Um, but how has it in particular affected um, young people? Uh, um, that could be negatively, and I guess also there probably are some positives to come out, but, but you know, what, what are some of the negative impacts? We might go to you, Dylan. Um, yeah, what has so the, the negative impact? So I think it's, and again, it's been said a million times before, but it's really um, magnified a lot of pre-existing issues um, and, and many that we, that we that we spoke about just then before that fantastic um, musical performance. But um, I know that up in the Kimberley, much the same as, as here in Perth, many places around the country, um, that access to, to housing and affordable rent um, has been, it's it's really out of reach for so many people and that's been exacerbated um, because of COVID uh, and because our borders are closed um, and we've got a lot of returning people coming home um, and they need a place to live. And in a large part, that's increased the rent. And, you know, we need to find a place for somewhere to live, someone to live. And I don't think there's a really good way to avoid that. Um, but that is an, an example of how COVID um, has impacted um, on a lot of young people, maybe looking at moving away from home, um, setting themselves up. It, it's pretty tough at the moment to do that unless you're in a pretty stable job. Um, even then you're looking at spending a lot of your money each week on rent. Um, so yeah, I think that that's one of the ways um, that it's increased that. It's increased the general inequality, people out of, out of work and, and out of jobs, in and out, especially casual workers, which are predominantly or in, in large part young people. Um, whether that be um, young people in high school getting their first job or in uni or, or even after graduating because it's hard to come across a, a graduate position or a full-time or a part-time job as well um, when you, once you finish your study. Um, so it, it's, it's pretty difficult and without those fundamentals, sort of a roof over your head and sustainable income um, and, you know, the current rate of, of youth allowance or, or job job seeker, I think it is, um, is not enough to, to pay for rent, keep a roof over your head um, and pay for um, maybe fuel to put in the car to, to drive to, to, to Centrelink or to a job interview or to the grocery store, um, to buy the groceries, to pay your rent, um, to pay your, your utility, sorry. And also, you know, you've got to have a phone, you've got to have internet. It's tough um, and sort of if you miss any one of those fundamentals at the moment, a lot of young people are in really precarious situations um, and sort of any of those sort of building blocks to, I guess, a, a strong future, um, era, any of those aren't in place, um, you're in a pretty tricky situation. And I think for, for a lot of young people um, at the moment, that's, that's where they find themselves. And what about yeah, you, I Steph? What do you think? Yeah, I was just, I was going to go off what Dylan was saying. I think he really took, I guess, the majority of the, the ideas that were in my mind. Sorry. Um, but I think to, to, to go off what Dylan was saying, um, taking it that next step of then talking about job prospects and those transferable skills that you would otherwise learn if you're at TAFE or at uni or doing an apprenticeship. So often I've seen that just go out the window with this pandemic and, and being stuck at home with, with lockdown. I, I also think that there is a major loss of opportunities for the future where we would have done a lot of networking, for example, or, mm. you know, going to job interviews, moving things online becomes difficult. If, if you're a young person, uh, you know, who's living by yourself, it, it can be tricky to, to get onto the internet, to, to even do those job interviews. And so you 
automatically see a lot of this this inequality or, or inequity inequity between young people who who do have access to those those things that we often take for granted and, and young people who don't have access to that and then I, I think going off that with being at home or being in lockdown often it's it's very tricky when it comes to establishing or, or maintaining a support network I, I don't think we should underestimate the value of these formative years of building friendships and, and relationships with others and, and being stuck at home is very difficult. And I think we've seen with the increasing rates of, um, you know, suicide and, and also, you know, mental health concerns as well. It's obviously taking a massive toll on, on young people. I think it was what just yesterday in New South Wales, um, Lifeline, I think, reported uh, the, the biggest increase in in people, you know, reaching out, which I think is fantastic. But at the same time, it's obviously showing, you know, the the difficulty that young people in particular, I think, are having at home, and and particularly for those young people who, you know, might come from uh, culturally and linguistically diverse communities or from queer communities, accessing telehealth consults from home can be really difficult particularly if you're not in a safe space or you know if you don't have a stable home or if you're you're moving around and experiencing homelessness so i definitely think that uh the, the pandemic has exacerbated a lot of issues that that young people previously faced um and i definitely think that it, it has played a massive role in i guess almost stunting i guess or, or stalling our our i guess development and opportunities as as a, a community of youth do you think now um you know given that the world and, and i and you know australia we've had time to sit back and really do nothing and and reflect and look at at what's been going on what do you think now we could be doing um or what actions could we be taking so that when we emerge from this COVID world, hopefully, or once this you know pandemic is over, what actions could we be taking now to sort of build and make, what, what do you guys want to see that world look like? <laughs> Tough question. <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, better would, would be a good place to start. Um, <laughs> I think, yeah, a, a world where young people or people in general, because I think that that's probably young people being young is is just sort of the the starting block to, to living a, a full life. Um, so ensuring that every young person, but, but every person around the world has those um, sort of fundamentals, which is having enough food to put on the table um, is, you know, having a house to have that table in and a bed to stay in, access to quality education um, and, and good economic prospects. Um, that's kind of the, the an ideal world um, and, and sprinkle, sprinkle sustainability and, and net zero carbon emissions. And I think it, it's a pretty good start. Um, there, there's a lot of issues, um, but yeah, I think meeting those fundamentals and I think a lot of the other issues will sort of start to to resolve themselves a lot sooner once people have those fundamentals met do you have anything to add steph or, or a vision of what you would like to see the world when we emerge i think that dylan has uh, created a, a lovely utopia uh and i would absolutely love to see uh that kind of i guess world i i guess on a on a smaller scale though I would love to see young people more involved in, I guess, the creation of resources for them and, and I guess, being kind of brought into the fold when it comes to, um, you know, decision making uh, on, a, on a higher level. I think conversations that I've had, for example, with friends or, or other young people or even young people that I've met through UN youth over the course of this pandemic that's now lasted, what, a year and a half so far. I definitely have seen hordes of young people who are interested in curbing COVID-19 misinformation and are very pro getting vaccinated and, and stopping the spread. And yet often I think 
particularly when New South Wales went back into lockdown, we sort of heard that young people were the ones that were, were spreading COVID and, you know, we, we had to stop doing so even though we didn't necessarily have access to to the vaccine anyway um and so i would love i guess a greater amount of, of trust being placed uh in young people to be able to create resources for their communities and speak to their communities um i definitely think we 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 take a lot of pride um in thinking that we're right uh and wanting to make you know progress in in the community that we're in so i would definitely love to see i guess the voices of young people be elevated because i know and i have come across so many amazing young people who have so much to say and and they're putting so much passion into action in their communities that often isn't getting the um the the i guess the the recognition that that it deserves how has um, the pandemic then impacted the way that young people can advocate for the issues that they're concerned about? I, I mean, mean, there's the obvious, well, but... <laughs> look, I think what we, we saw a lot of prior to the pandemic was, you know, striking or, you know, putting on protests, um, you know, working, you know, within organisations, going into communities. And I think a lot of that has been brought online. And if anything, I think that's actually strengthened our resolve as young people to, to continue advocating for the issues that we're most passionate about. So I definitely think that while there has been, you know, I guess concerns when it comes to, you know, having that lack of support network, not necessarily having that face to face interaction and being able to work with communities in the way that we probably would like to, being able to kind of move that online in a way that potentially older people um, aren't able to or aren't as tech savvy, you know, with when it comes to, you know, building those online programs. I think young people have done that really effectively, which is something that I'm really proud of and, and something that I've seen a lot of over this past uh, year and a half. Dylan, uh, Dylan, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I, I get not, not as much to be completely honest, and that's probably coming from that position um, of being in WA where, where we've sort of haven't had as, as long and, and large scale lockdowns, fingers crossed that continues. Um, and, and we have still seen, you know, large scale protests happen here. Um, so yeah, I think we, we've seen a lot of things move online and, and I agree with Steph that that's probably increased, um, the, the, the strength of that movement. Um, it's also opened it up to people that aren't in um, in in the city. I mean, I I grew up in a town. Um, sort of, it would be a, a four hour drive and a three hour flight to to get to Perth. And you know, it's being being a young person that's that's keen to get involved um, with with some of these movements. Um, a few years ago, um, would have loved for them to be more accessible online. Um, so I think that it that it is something that that's probably growing and seeing more young people engage in online spaces for discussions like this, for example, um, is is really, really powerful and, and quite strong. And I, and I hope that continues even after lockdown finishes um, because it, it does open up a lot of these um, pretty interesting discussions to a lot more than than one particular city, which I think we, we often sort of run sort of little events like this or or large protests but but they happen in the city being able to sort of show that support and solidarity and participate from from near and far is something that i hope continues um what you know given that there is an increase in the concern felt by young people um regarding housing job security and just you know the general recovery from the effects of COVID 19 what, what message of hope do you guys have to spread out that you'd like to say now? Um, I guess I can be pretty pessimistic and cynical at the best of times, <laughs> but I think potentially that, that message would, would come down to two things. First of all, and I guess the first aspect of, of this is not so much a message, but rather I think a call to action for accountability from our governments um, and, and those who 
do have institutional power who often aren't young people, um, particularly for those young people who are from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds or from queer communities, um, you know, and, and so, I definitely think that I would like to see the government doing more. That would be my message of hope on that front. And then I think the second thing is, I guess as a young person, you can often feel as though the weight of the world is on your shoulders. There are so many things to be angry about. I remember I, I always think about this story. I think I was about eight or nine and uh, I come from a, a Macedonian background where you know my, my lunch you know was packed every morning by myself and I would always have some sort of you know ethnic sort of cuisine that wasn't a stock standard sandwich and and I would always have kids you know make fun of me for it and I remember you know at, at one one day I sort of came home and, and had to admit that you know someone had thrown out my lunch because it didn't look appetizing and and i remember feeling so angry and and then i started kind of researching this stuff um and and realized that these microaggressions although i didn't know the word for it when i was nine years old and in, in front of my my tiny desktop um you know and, and i started learning about things like racism and then I realized the world wasn't so kind to women all the time and then I realized all these things progressively as I got older and I just remember saying to my mum I'm so mad at everything um and I have no idea what to do I just have this anger um and you know you would you know you would guess then it was quite a shock when uh, teenage me found out about things like job insecurity and you know uh you know the, the housing affordability crisis and the climate emergency but i think what i've really learned in you know my limited number of years on this earth is that my message of hope would probably be taking that anger and channeling it channeling it into some kind of passion i guess um putting it into something that you really love doing and whether that's a trade or an art or whether it's academia or you know a professional job I think taking that anger and channeling it into some kind of passion for a purpose is probably the one thing that keeps me going every day because I just know otherwise I would be internalizing so much anger at you know and madness at you know the apathy from you know our government or you know other I guess authorities so i think yeah putting that into some kind of passion um and, and just that being the incentive that gets you through your day sometimes you just got to be mad to make a point <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a big believer in that though and i and i think you know in the in the past in particular last year we saw a lot of people get mad because you know time was up it was time to actually look at, at some real issues going on and and address them dylan what's your message of hope that you would like to give to young people a message of hope um i these sort of questions always um can can invoke a, a, a soppy kind of a response um everything's going to be okay you're, you're fantastic as you are go out and, and change the world <laughs> Um, and it normally comes from older people as well. So it's interesting um, being asked it. I, it's, I think it, it probably comes down to sort of what, what Steph mentioned there. And, and, and that's about, I guess, needing to agitate. Um, and that's probably what young people and, and people right across society um, need to continue doing. Um, because we're, you know, there's a lot of anger. There's a lot of, um, a, a feeling that the, the world isn't the way that it should be. And if it continues going down this path, um, then we will be in a pretty ordinary situation. Um, we're, we're, we're looking at, at so many issues that, that, that it's, a, it's so hard to even sort of contemplate um the the devastation that's going to be caused if we continue going the way we are especially when it comes to climate change but also um in 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 our economy at the moment um and, and the way things are heading and i think probably yeah it's it's probably a message of hope that that's sort of dependent on whether people continue to agitate for change um in, in whatever way works best for them 
Um, personally, I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of agitating for change by, by making a seat at the table um, and by getting directly involved in, in those um, discussions and decision-making processes. Um, but you've also got protests and rallies and, and ways to, to rally support behind causes. Um, and, you know, I, it, it, it's sort of, it's the story of, of our country and the world is things don't change until people agitate to change it. Um, and that's probably the, the biggest bit of hope that I have at the moment is I'm seeing that happen. Um, I'm seeing that, that change be made. Um, you know, we, we've got so many issues. We want to focus on climate change at the moment. The federal government that doesn't really have a strong um, climate, like we don't have a 2050 target. It's sort of saying we might get there if we're lucky, um, but you've got organisations already that, that, have, that have set those targets for themselves and, and banks and financial institutions. And you've got things like I mentioned before is sort of the beef industry saying we're going to be there by 2030. And all of that's coming because people are agitating. Um, and not just people in Australia agitating, people right around the world agitating. Um, we're, we're a global interconnected society and, 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 a, and, a, and an earth. Um, and people say that Australia doesn't make too much of a difference for a small country on the global scale. Um, but we're starting to see that trickle through. Um, so I think that my message of hope is not to be hopeless, um, but yeah, to, to channel that into into making the, the changes you want to see in the world. Beautiful. I like that message too. And um, just before we, we uh, I'm meant to be wrapping up, but um, Kekish, um, Kekishan from Canada has just joined. Um, so we're going to, she's going to join us quickly. Hello, how are you? Good, thank you. How are you? Very good, very good. We've, we've probably got time for about um, two questions, um, if that's okay, before we have to wrap this up. Um, but, but I want to start, um, uh, basically, you know, today is International Youth Day, um, and we've had a bit of a chat about that. But I want to know, what, what does that mean to you, Kekishan, um, and why, how does that, you know, what's that significant to your work and what you do? Absolutely. Well, International Youth Day is very special to my organization, Green Hope Foundation, because it is our birthday. I founded Green Hope Foundation uh, nine years ago in 2012, and I chose International Youth Day because, uh, you know, young people have so much power to bring about change in this world. And we are so often overlooked as well because of our age. And just to like show the world that we have that power uh, to bring about change. And that is exactly what we at Green Hope Foundation do every single day to prove the naysayers wrong through the level impact. So for us, International Youth Day is really every single day that we are able to make a positive difference in people's lives, whether that is uh, we just implemented uh, a mobile library, two mobile libraries in India and Bangladesh to ensure that education reaches uh, the children who had dropped out. So for us, that is a celebration of International Youth Day uh, to ensuring that they have access to clean water and sanitation because that is a basic human right and something that so many young people in a marginalized community still don't have access to. So really, that is International Youth Day for us and just commemorating our uh, birthday in that way every day. Well, happy birthday to your fa um, foundation, the Green Hope Foundation. Um, and then I want to quickly on the on the topic of the theme for this year. Um, what what do you think it mean we mean by when we look at um, how we can better serve people um, th through food systems? How do you think food systems can do that, and how can young people help to make that change? Absolutely. I think that, you know, I'm really glad that this theme was chosen because a lot of the time, again, the relation between young people in food systems is not seen, but at the same time, they do play, we do play a very important role in the sense that every single person plays an important role in ensuring that we create and maintain sustainable and healthy food systems for human and planetary well-being. And, you know, as young people, the first step that we can take is to 
educate ourselves and then educate our families and our communities and in agricultural societies. And we've seen this, uh, you know, working with, within agricultural societies across the world, the young people, the young farmers play a very important role in coming up with those innovative tactics to ensure that they're able to have sustainable farming. Uh, and just giving Green Hope's example, we uh, catalyze that through the distribution of organic seeds, through the distribution of uh, livestock for not just like the young people, but for the women as well who work with them and for the girls to ensure that they have the resources to be able to move towards the creation of more uh, sustainable food systems. But just in general, young people do have a very big role to play, even in urban environments, can be as simple as growing your own food. And that, that's something that is one of our campaigns that actually is led by our children's board members. And it's truly amazing to see the impact that they've been able to make in the sense they've been able to inspire their friends in their school and their communities to grow their own food as well and really create this uh, local mini circular bioeconomy, including making their own compost. So they're eating healthy, they're able to help out their community in their own small way and also ensure food security. So yeah, there's a lot that young people can do, but the most important thing is identifying their local challenges, seeing how best they can uh, create sustainable food systems in that way and really going from there. Yeah, and I think it's a really good point you made as well, because often people who live in big cities probably don't feel like they have much of a role to play when it comes to agriculture or growing their own food. But it, it, it can be as simple as, you know, growing some vegetables in whatever, if it's a courtyard or a windowsill, whatever you've got access to, or looking towards, um, you know, community gardens, that sort of thing. Um, Kakashan, I also want to just, we, we briefly talked about at the end, um, we were talking about the impacts COVID have had on young people in particular, um, and in terms of, you know, access to, you know, there's a concern um, felt around accessing um, housing, job security, and just the general recovery. What, what message would you have for young people who are concerned about how COVID has really impacted their lives and what their future is going to look like? They might be concerned. What, what message would you have? Yeah, absolutely. I think COVID has really shown us like where the inequalities lie and, and you know, with young people all around the world, so many of us already being from marginalized communities, it's exacerbated, but you know, I always have that hope for a better future and I think young people embody that as well. I definitely say that, uh, you know, first of all, especially with, you know, the, the job security and all of that, uh, we have gone too long just defining success in one way. So, you know, I think one thing that young people can do now is just be their own boss. I think that, uh, yeah, like the opportunity for creating new jobs is ripe and I think that it's really important that young people now step up and see that how we can create this new normal. And one of the first steps can be by creating new jobs that are most catered to the needs and wants of young people. So that is one thing. And the other thing is that COVID has really shown us how important it is to come together, the importance of multilateralism, the importance of working together. So instead of playing the blame game, and you know, I think young people are often tokenized as just blaming the government, just blaming private sector, and you know, sometimes rightfully so, but now it's the time to work together to see where we can find, uh, like, you know, the common ground and see how best we can all bring our unique lived experiences to the table. We are really able to create a better and newer normal for everyone where no one's left behind. And I'm, I definitely have the hope that this kind of collaboration can be led by young people. I think that's a very lovely message. Um, and I wanna thank all of you um, for joining me. It's been a very um, insightful, inspiring conversation we've had. Um, and to conclude, to wrap this up, we're gonna um, hear from Affinity Youth Representative, Sasha Klimovitard, um, who will present the closing remarks. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to sincerely thank uh, Affinity, uh, UN Youth, and the Green Hope Foundation for bringing to light um, a much needed conversation. Tonight, we've reflected on how we can understand the importance of International Youth Day and how to be proactive. Indeed, this recognition is key to achieving international. 
Uh, I'd like to sincerely thank uh, Affinity, uh, UN Youth, and the Green Hope Foundation for bringing to light um, a much needed conversation. Tonight we have reflected on how we can understand the importance of International Youth Day and how to be proactive. Indeed, this recognition is key to achieving international cooperation in solving national and international problems of human and planetary health and supporting youth innovation. Most obviously, climate change is a substantial and growing threat to the health and uh, to the health, food supply, safety, and economic position of today's young people and children. Kekishan, Steph, Dylan, thank you so much for your valuable contributions, not only to tonight's webinar, but to our global youth community. Thank you, Jack, for generously facilitating this event. Iris, thank you for your warm welcoming. And Hannah and Emily, thank you for your lovely performance. I believe tonight is reflective of Affinity, UN Youth and Green Hope Foundation's commitment to the sustainability, the maintenance and practice of peace and social good throughout a society and world. Young people are saplings of power, strength and intelligence. If trained and educated properly, they can become heroes of capable overcoming obstacles and acquire a mind that, that promises enlightenment to hearts and order to the world. Every nation's progress depends on the spirit and consciousness, the upbringing and education give it, given to its young people. In other words, nations that have raised their young people correctly are always ready for progress. It is necessary to develop alternative projects through young generations and to make plans alongside every participants and of young individuals to sustain and maintain their motivation and to broaden their horizons. I believe it's crucial for politicians and sociologists uh, for philosophers, pedagogues, policymakers, and educators, for them to come together and to try and develop a language of helping youth and young generations maintain the environment, dialogue, peace, and collaboration. Essentially, they should provide the means for a healthy and responsive society to flourish in all aspects. Uh, we are all aware that we all live in an inter interconnected world with shared goals. If youth or young people or young generations are supported by communities, they can provide an opportunity for Australia and the world to improve health and well-being within their own countries. They also promote a sustainable path to prosperity within their region and beyond. Finally, with this support and motivation for youth, their actions and mission can sustain the promotion of peace, prosperity and environmental sustainability in their countries and in their region. This will help secure the world's own environmental and economic future. Thank you very much.